so thanks very much for the intro and thanks for the, for the invitation. I, I told uh, Michael this morning, this is like really a fantastic idea to have this workshop. I would love to see more of these in NFA in general. Um, we should all stick together, right? Okay, so um, I'm a computer scientist. How many people here are computer scientists? I mean, I know we're in the computer science building, but <laughs> physics, <laughs> physics, also physics, okay, math. Ah, uh, there's always so few mathematicians. All right, you guys are a dying breed. All right, um, but okay, this is supposed to be accessible hopefully to everybody. There'll be a bit of everything in it, um, but stop me at any time, ask me any questions, yeah? Um, so this is really about variational quantum algorithms and trying to um, study them uh, in a rigorous sense uh, and their limitations in particular in this work. Okay, and of course the motivation for all of this is the fact that there's a lot of money going into uh, quantum computing, a lot of which is going into these uh, rigorous study, um, sorry, these variational heuristic studies, right? Um, so Germany, of course, is no slouch here. We've got uh, 2 billion euros. And what I'm told is that most of this is going into industry, uh, frankly, to study things like heuristic algorithms for optimization and things like this, okay? By the way, how many people here do work on variational stuff? Does anybody actually work on this stuff? Okay, good. Good. So I don't think I need to tell you guys about this, right? This is the era we're currently in. We're in the noisy intermediate scale quantum computation era. And the question here is, um, you know, we've got these little toys in our labs now, right? And so industry's uh, quite happy. And what can we do with these near-term devices? And, um, you know, there's a few limitations. Typically the one, you know, we'll focus on today is depth. Okay, so depth is important, right? Because um, these uh, systems are very noisy. So if your circuit gets very depth, you know, the whole thing de decoheres before you can do anything useful. Okay. Good. So here is, um, I think without question, the kind of most, prolific framework in the in the NISC era for very um, quantum algorithm design, which is variational quantum algorithms. Uh, the concept is really very simple. They're basically just parameterized quantum algorithms. Okay. Um, so you have your little quantum box here. And you know, I drew this box smaller than this box for a reason. Uh, this is our baby quantum computers that we have nowadays, which are not so big. This is our big powerful supercomputer that's classical. And you know, this thing is like I'll show you on the next slide what's happening under this hood, but it's basically like a parameterized quantum circuit. You feed in some parameters. These will ultimately be rotation angles. Uh, the quantum computer is supposed to compute something, right? Some some sort of output, um, and hopefully that output is good for minimizing some cost function f that you have in mind, like here. And you know, that output comes out. You get some feedback, and classically, maybe you do it via gradient descent, machine learning, you know, whatever variational approach you have, you try and optimize these parameters, and you you go around the loop again. Okay, and you keep going until you hopefully find a good set of parameters that give you a good value for your cost function, okay? Um, this is the basic premise of VQAs. And the goal is, of course, you want this box to be as small as possible because our current quantum computers frankly suck. And so um, in particular, they need to be low depth, okay? Any questions here? Okay, good. So what's happening under the hood in that quantum box, right? So. Really what's happening is the following. I said it's a parameterized setting. And so uh, this is that box Q. Uh, you get some angles that get plugged in. Okay, these are the classical parameters that go in. And like I said, it's a parameterized circuit. So this is a unitary that depends on this angle. So, you know, essentially what happens is that, you know, I have some problem in mind. Say I'm BMW, I'm trying to optimize some manufacturing process on the, on the car floor. Um, I think, oh, you know, I have some set of rotation axes, some ansatz that would be for some reason good for, coming up with a good solution to this optimization problem, right? That's just a good guess, right? That's not systematic. So you fix uh, the rotation axes, the Hamiltonians essentially, right? So these guys. And what you plug in then are the rotation angles. Okay, and then you try and find the best rotation angles. And we'll see an example of say for max cut where you're trying to private, uh, try and solve this to something like max cut where you know the rotation axes are, it's fairly intuitive what you might pick. For those familiar, I mean, just think of this, it's basically the adiabatic algorithm, right? You just kind of truncate the thing, um, do it to short depth, um, but then the, the, the angles you choose in trotterization, normally they're very, very small, infinitesimally small, but you don't have that many layers, so now you have to allow yourself to kind of shortcut through the Hilbert space to get somewhere interesting, okay? That's kind of where all of this comes from. Good. Like I said, I'm gonna keep saying it over and over because um, our results will really be about depth. We want to minimize the depth of this ansatz. Let me be clear, by depth, I don't mean circuit depth, I mean the number of boxes here. Okay, that's that's what counts as depth. Maybe 
because depends. Like the yes, I mean, so I think that's also a viable way to define it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty standard to just say, okay, the number of boxes in your evolution, and that's what we'll do, but um, you can also do it that way. Um, but you know, the way this is kind of one of the standard ways to define depth, and it's just easier to analyze, is the other thing, right? So. OK. Any questions, by the way, otherwise? Just stop me at any time. Good. Um, a special case. Uh, at least as a computer scientist, this is where I um, first. What, yeah, what go ahead. Oh, so in the end, you end up in this one state of the measure? Curve? Oh, good. Sorry, sorry. Yes. Um, so you run this ansatz, you get a quantum state, and you measure it. And you measure the whole thing, and it gives you some string, right? And then maybe you're trying to solve max cut, and you, you check, does that thing define a good cut in the graph? Um, or maybe it gives you some other feedback. Depends on the context, yeah. But it will give you some string, and depending on the context, you can see what you're going to use that string for. I'll give you an example now. Yeah. Any other questions? OK, good. So here's a, a concrete example um, by Farhi Goldstone and Gutmann, right? I think probably most of you have heard this before, at least, the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, uh, QAOA. And this is an example where you're trying to solve a combinatorial problem called max cut. And in max cut, you know, the, the idea is very simple, right? You have a, a graph and you want to know how close to bipartite is this graph, right? So I want to split the edges and the vertices into two halves, a left half, a right half, so that as many edges as possible cross this cut in the middle. This is a famous MP hard problem. It's MP hard to approximate. Um, and in fact, it's um, unique games hard to approximate better than 0.878, this famous Gomez Williamson ratio, right? And you know, I've talked to Eddie Farhi directly, and I've asked him to his face, like, is he, you know, when they came up with this QAOA algorithm, their goal was actually to try and disprove this unique games conjecture, which is with a quantum algorithm, which hasn't happened yet. I'll tell you a bit about what we know in the next slide. But what's the idea here? You're trying to find a good cut. And so what do you do? Um, you're, you're two Hamiltonians. Basically, on the previous slide, I had um, multiple boxes. And here you have basically two boxes that you alternate back and forth between. So one Hamiltonian encodes uh, the max cut instance, right? The other one encodes some starter uh, mixing Hamiltonian, basically. So basically, if, if you know anything about adiabatic quantum computing, this is exactly the setup you'd use for adiabatic, right? You'd start with this Hamiltonian, and you'd evolve to this one. That's it. And so the basic premise is what now? You know, I don't want to do many, many layers as in standard trotterization for adiabatic computing. So I squish the whole thing down to level D alternation. So here it is. So I do H1, H2, H1, H2. But you know, if these guys' angles are very, very tiny, then this whole thing will look essentially like an identity evolution, right? So now I, you get to pick these angles to be quite big, and you try and shortcut through the Hilbert space. This is the whole premise of the, the ansatz. And when you're done, you know, this is Christian's question, you just measure psi in the standard basis, you get a string, and you just check, is this a good cut in the graph or not? Right? This is the, at least the way QAOA was originally done. OK, and again, uh, a pressing question has always been, what is the right layer in this um, to go to? How many alternations do you need to get something interesting? Well, you know, the, yeah. the, string, the bits of the string are edges in the graph, and the bits are the one that's part of the graph. Yes, essentially, yes, exactly. Yeah. So if you see 1, 0, um, that means that you know, those two vertices are opposite sides of the cut. Bits are the nodes, right? Yeah. Edges, well, yeah, but pairs of bits will be the edges, essentially, yes. So if I put if I label a, a node with a one, it's on say the right side. If I label it with zero, it's on the left side. Good. So at least to me, and I think to many people, this was exciting in the beginning because they actually managed to get a non-trivial approximation ratio out of this thing, even at the first level. Um, I mean, this is interesting to me for various reasons. Like we have better classical ratios, 0.878 with Gurman's Williamson, STP based, but it's very hard to get anything other than an STP based approximation algorithm for max cut. Um, so the fact that you can get something quantumly was actually quite interesting. And so um, you know, there are various uh, results that came out around that time, like uh, we can't up simulate the output distribution of even level one of this thing. And of course, if you let this thing grow in depth, it's essentially like truncated um, adiabatic, so it's universal. And of course, later, you know, as you probably know with the variational story, less good news starts to come in, right? Um, so we now know that you know, the original goal of beating the Scrimmons-Williamson algorithm, which would allow us to disprove this so-called unique games conjecture, 
Um, that's not going to happen with a small number of levels in this hierarchy. And that's a huge problem simply because it's very hard to analyze anything beyond like one or two as a number of levels. And you know, there are many, many heuristic studies right? That you probably see on the archive every day. There are usually multiple variation VQA type papers. And what was shown um, as a first hardness result was this work by um, Lennart and Martin. And they showed basically if you kind of specify the depth ahead of time, say, I want you to use this depth. Now, all you have to do is figure out the right rotation angles. This is NP-hard. You can encode NP-hard problems. OK, but we wanted to say something more general. Uh, we wanted to really understand what is the, the complexity of getting kneeling that depth down. OK? So let me state our results. For this, I first uh, need to define the optimization problem we're trying to um, give a result about. OK? So what do I mean by optimizing depth? Good. So what do I have? We're talking about VQA. I have a set of local Hamiltonians H. Um, these are going to be my rotation axes. I have some measurement at the end M. And I have two depth thresholds that I need you to decide between. OK? In the S case, I promise you that there's a low depth um, ansatz, meaning I only need to do D1 alternations. OK? Um, you can pick any sequence of Hamiltonians out of the set I've given you, basically, with any rotation angles, and apply them in any order you like. And the ansatz state you prepare when you do this will have you know, good measurement statistics, whatever M defines as good. And in the no case, I promise you that to get any sort of um, Good measurement statistics, you really need to use a very deep circuit. So um, even if you use up to D2 depth, uh, when you prepare the state, you're going to have you know, bad measurement statistics. OK? That's the setup. So any questions about the definition of the problem? Because if you don't understand, you're going to be unhappy. Yeah. Like, what do you mean by input? Like, oh, I think we, um, we probably do it in unary. Because you should be allowed to work certainly in time polynomial in the in the depth, yes. Yeah. Um, so somehow, um, is it to me? It's, it's not intuitively clear that yeah. um, like uh, the measurement statistics smaller one third should be a yes instance and yeah larger. Is it? Is it? Does it matter? It doesn't really matter. You could flip them around. You could shift them. You could yeah. So the the actual measurement itself is trivial in the end. It's just a single qubit z measurement. So the, the interesting part is in the angles and the Hamiltonians, frankly. No? How is M represented? M is just, basically, it's a constant size matrix, if you like. It's a single qubit measurement. So it's, right. yeah, yeah, don't worry. So M is not very interesting in the end. Yeah. I mean, this is in contrast to uh, Lennart and Martin's previous work, where M was actually very important. But, but here, we do the reduction in a different way. Yeah. Yes, good. So uh, there's a reason I have two depth thresholds, and you know this is going to come up on the next slide. Yeah, good. Good, but intuitively the idea is supposed to be that you know when there's a gap between these two, it's it, it's hard to tell if either there's a very short circuit that's good or the best circuit you know really is very requires a very large depth. We want to make it very hard to distinguish those cases. Yeah. So, so by the low universality argument, can you just uh, like embed the classical length, minimal length of the circuit problem in there? Um, you, I suspect you should be able to, right? Yeah, you probably can. But there, I mean, okay, if you're talking about something like the minimum circuit size problem there, you, you're given the full truth table as input. So it's a bit of a different problem. That's why it's so hard to prove that problem's MP hard, because uh, you really get a full description of the truth table there. Yeah, but that's a good point, absolutely. Okay, good. So um, the main result we show is basically, that, of course, this problem is hard, but nobody expects it to be easy. But it's maybe surprisingly hard. OK, it's um, harder than NP-hard. It's what we call QCMA-hard. I'll define this later. But it's hard in the sense that in the worst way possible, like even if the ratio between the two depths I gave you is basically the input size, like it's n to the 1 minus epsilon for any epsilon, um, even then you can't distinguish, even when these two things are so far apart. Again, um, I, nobody expects this to be an easy problem, of course. Let me be clear. OK, so that's what we have, even up to large multiplicative factors. is intractable. This gives us the first uh, natural QCMA hard to approximate problem. And you know, I'll tell you about QCMA in a second, but um, you should know that it's, of course, harder than NP, but easier than QMA. OK? Any questions about this slide? Why do you say QCMA hard to approximate? 
that yeah. because it's not supposed to get uh, is that the approximation? That's right, yes. Okay. Yes. So even if you could solve like this when the gaps are so far apart, if you could do that, then you could solve any QCMA problem basically. All right? Yeah. That's it. It's hard, but it's not complete. It's com well, it's complete, it's trivially complete because it's easy to solve this problem in QCMA. You just send me the rotation angles, right? And then I just run the circuit myself. I'm a quantum computer. Good. OK, um, so and then after this, we can show that you know I talked about QAOA a little bit, where the difference, remember, was that in VQA, I can have you know, a set of Hamiltonians you could rotate a, uh, according to. In QAOA, you only get two Hamiltonians that you have to alternate between. And so even in this setting, we can show essentially an analogous result. Um, I won't go into this in much depth, but the main thing is here, like I said, there's two Hamiltonians you get to alternate between, like so some cost Hamiltonian and some mixing Hamiltonian. OK? And there's some analogous definition. And you know, I'll just go to the next slide, which essentially shows the exact same statement. Uh, I just replaced the word min VQA with min QAOA. OK, so even if you want to solve QAOA um, to find the right depth, it's, it's very hard to nail it down to within large multiplicative factors. Uh, good, let me be clear. I'm a complexity theorist. That means I live in la-la land, right? I'm not connected to reality. So um, everything I do is perfect. Well, not me, but I work with perfect stuff, right? Uh, I assume an idealized computer. Um, some of them are open questions, or of course, what happens in the noisy setting? Because that's exactly where these NISC devices are being used, obviously, right? Um, complexity results are worst case, right? So you should always be careful. Satisfiability is worst case empty hard, but in practice, there's entire conferences devoted to solving it, and extremely well, frankly, right? So you always have to be careful about worst case results. So I'm not trying to say give up with VQA. I'm saying don't expect a general purpose algorithm. Good. Any questions at this point? Do you have an estimate for how much time I have? Just so I could. Yeah. Um, it's hard to approximate. I know. <laughs> that was a good answer. <laughs> okay. Yeah, fine. Okay. Good. So um, I, I'm not going to assume anybody here is a complexity theorist. So let me just define what we mean by QCMA. Okay, for the audience. So first, you know, this is the de facto definition of quantum NP. Okay, quantum Merlin Arthur. Um, this is what happens if you take NP and you replace essentially the classical proof with a quantum proof and the classical verifier with a quantum verifier, roughly speaking. Okay, so basically you have, um, in the yes case, there is a good proof, psi, on poly n qubits so that you accept with high probability. Here's my verifier, right? It takes in a proof and just measures the first qubit and just says accept or reject. And in the no case, all proofs uh, need to be accepted with low probability. Okay, so this is QMA. This is not what we're studying. Good. Any questions? Good. OK. Um, so for those of you who are not in complexity theory, um, there's something you should know, which is that in, in the quantum world, there's actually more than one definition of quantum NP. OK? And it's not you know, this nice, actually. It's more like this, right? We have quite a lot of them, unfortunately. And in fact, you know, we have so many of them that you know, I can name them after the, the dwarves in Snow White story. Okay, We have the, really that much. Um, if you want a whole treatise on you know, Snow White and her dwarves, you, know, you can go read this um, preprint. But you know, here's QCMA. This is the version I'll focus on today. Um, QCMA is happy. Okay? So let me tell you about QCMA. So this is exactly QMA. The only difference is that you know, the proof is now a classical string. That's the only difference. Okay, so in the S case, I have a verifier. And there's a good string you could feed in that makes this verifier accept on this qubit with high probability. And in the no case, uh, for all proofs you feed in, this thing will reject with high probability. OK, that's it. It's yes and no, Yain, right? In the sense that uh, exist BPP is not, you know, there's this question of exist BPP versus MA, right? Um, they're not quite the same. And so you still have a bit of that conundrum, but. But we're not assuming that in, in, the, in the yes case that all proofs are accepted with probability at least a third and at most. Oh. Do you know what I mean? Sorry, sorry. There's this minor technicality, which is a pain in the ass, but you know, for most people, it doesn't matter. OK, good. I'm glad you agree. First person I met. OK, good. It, uh, it bothers me, too. OK, good. And of course, the main question is, you know, I have a quantum computer. Why the hell are you giving me a classical string? Right? I mean, it seems like such a weird thing to do. And this is one of the things about QCMA. It's hard to find good natural problems for it. But you know, 
let me just go back to this slide, right? There's a whole industry now on bent, hell bent on running quantum computers that are parameterized by classical parameters, right? So if there's ever a time to use a classical proof to run a quantum computer, it's, it's obviously this, right? This is a, a clear fit. And so this is why you might expect to get not just MP hardness for VQA, but indeed QCME hardness. And QCME is the upper bound, right? Because as a proof, you tell me what these angles are, and then I could, as a polytime computer, quantum computer, I could run this, OK? Good. So in the remaining time, I'll just try and give you a bit of the, the proof sketches to give you a flavor of how this is done. Uh, it's not super difficult by any means. If you've done any of like Hamiltonian complexity before, you could probably even guess some of the steps, OK? So um, let me kind of lay out what we're trying to do for those who are not familiar, you know, used to doing these kinds of reductions, OK? So I have an arbitrary QCMA instance, right? And I want to show that I can take this and I can embed it into an instance of depth minimization, OK? And the key thing I need is that in the depth minimization instance, remember, I have my, my set of Hamiltonians according to which you could rotate. And then I have my two depth thresholds. And in the S case, what I want is that you know, if there is a good proof that the QCMA circuit was going to accept, then there's a low depth VQA circuit that gives me good measurement results. And in the no case, if you know, there's no good proof for V, then it should be the case that you really need a high depth VQA circuit uh, to get good measurement results. Okay, so in other words, if you can distinguish the, the right depth to use, then you could have solved the original QCMA problem. And so you've embedded this into this. This is the idea, right? This is the game. I mean, complexity theorists don't actually solve anything, right? We just play the blame game, right? Instead of solving this, we reduce it to this, right? This is what we do. I mean, physicists shouldn't get cocky either, right? You guys aren't very good at proving statements either. <laughs> don't get me started on like uh, DMRG or whatever. And then when we finally prove it's like rigorously correct, you're like, yeah, whatever, we already knew that, right? <laughs> Um, OK, good. <laughs> so um, good, good. And the key thing, of course, is that we want this ratio to be big, because then we get this hardness of approximation result. That's the point. Good. So the main things we're, we're worried about, of course, is where do we get this hardness of approximation from, right? this large ratio? So normally, this comes from uh, PCP theorems. But you're probably all aware that quantum PCP is a huge open problem. Quantum PCP is, of course, not for QCMA. It's for QMA. But nevertheless. Um, finding hardness of approximation in the quantum setting is a pain in the ass. Number two, um, in our setup for VQA, unlike the previous results uh, with Martin and Leonard, um, we have no restriction on how you apply the Hamiltonians in your ansatz. You could do them in any order. You could do whatever angles you want. We really want to give you full flexibility. Okay? And so the question is, how do you enforce computational structure when you do this? Because I'm trying to embed a computation. And finally, you know, I won't say much about this, but you know, in the QAOA setting, you're even more restricted. You've only got two Hamiltonians. So all this logic has to get crammed into just two Hamiltonians now. OK, good. So let me tell you how we you know, deal with each of these. So the first one is actually not as bad as you would think it is, because you know, back about a decade ago now, and I always feel really old when I say this, um, just when I was a poor little student, um, Julia Kempe and I showed that you know, there is a problem, which is QC more hard to approximate. It's a ridiculously artificial problem. Like Nobody would ever care about it. It was an afterthought that we threw into the back of a paper, basically saying, what the hell, we'll just put this in. right? And so here's the problem. Let me define it, because we will need the definition. So QMSA for short, um, basically, you, know, you have a circuit. You know, it, it accepts what's called a monotone set. You don't need to know what that is. But the key point of this is that in the yes case, there is a, a proof, G, a classical proof, of low Hamming weight. OK. Um, Yes, good. Accepted by my prover, uh, verifier. And in the no case, um, you really need to give me a large Hamming weight if you want me to accept. OK, so the point is that we're talking about Hamming weights of strings. And we showed basically that this problem is hard to approximate QCME hard, uh, even if the ratio between Hamming weights grows suspiciously like the, the result I gave you in our work. OK? And you know, the really nice thing about this, the, I think the most clever part about this is not our work, but actually Chris Umans' work, who shows how to get MP hardness of approximation you know, without using a PCP in the usual sense. Okay, and, and I won't go into this. But this is for sigma 2. This is not for NP, to be clear. Good. So obviously, what we'll do is you know, we have a problem, which is artificial, but it's still hard to approximate. And so we can just do a standard uh, polytime reduction. Um, the trickiest part will be maintaining that hardness ratio. Okay. 
So that's step one. Step two, how do we enforce computational structure? Right? So um, let me just replace what I had before with what you've now learned. I'm not going to do a reduction from QCMA, but from this funny problem I defined. And remember, now I say in the S case, if there's a low Hemingway proof, that's good. Then there's a low depth circuit, that's good. And if all you need a large Hemingway weight on the left side, then you need a large depth circuit on the right side. This is the goal. So at a high level, I'll just give you bits and pieces of it to give you a flavor. OK, so um, we use basically a hybrid Cook, Levin, and Kitayev circuit Hamiltonian construction. If you don't know what that is, don't worry. I mean, they're standard tools to try and take uh, circuits and map them into ground spaces of local Hamiltonians. And I'll show you a little bit of this on the next slide so you get a flavor. Um, but the key point, like the intuition that you should extract is the following. Um, remember, in VQA, I have to give you some set of Hamiltonians according to which you can do evolutions, right? And you can pick what order you want to do them in. So we'll have four sets of Hamiltonians. And the first ham set of Hamiltonians you could choose to evolve according to. Intuitively, an honest prover would use it to prepare um, the proof Y. And this is this proof Y, the problem I'm starting with. OK, so and that allows you to prepare a proof. This one here allows you, you know, if you choose to do it honestly, allows you to simulate this verifier gate by gate. If you evolve those Hamiltonian terms, it'll simulate that verifier. And now I have two sets of Hamiltonians, which um, I haven't told you about. Here we need a, a special fancier kind of 2D clock, if you will. And this is, you know, the short version is this allows us to preserve the hardness gap. OK, sorry, that's it. So this is just a high-level idea. Any questions here? I'm sorry? Sure. Yeah, OK, good. I'm sorry? I'm puzzled by the 2D clock. Can you say one more sentence about what the two-dimensional time dimension Oh, uh, uh, no, no, yeah, OK. I'll... Next slide. Next slide will help a little bit. Yeah, but that, that's the right question to ask, yes. Good. Um, Here's in a slightly more depth, but I won't go through it a lot. OK, so um, you know, this is just a diagram, which I threw in for the sake of throwing in a diagram. Um, but the point is that we had four sets of Hamiltonians. You know, um, the first set I said is, if you evolve according to this, you choose to do that, then you can prepare proof qubits. And so for example, this is one of those Hamiltonians. It says on, you know, in register A, the jth qubit, if you want, you could evolve according to Pauli x, assuming the, the two clock registers are both set to 1. OK? For example, and this is if you're honest, you evolve according to this time, this will do a Pauli X for you. But you don't have to do it for that time, of course. And you know, analogously, if you've seen Kitaev's construction, you know, this is absolutely not surprising. Um, this allows you to apply the jth gate of the verifier, um, assuming your clocks look like this. So you go from this time step to this one. Okay, and so uh, these are Hamiltonians, and you can evolve them according to this time to get the right logic out. OK, so this is just you know, bits and pieces of the construction. Uh, how do you put it all together? Right? Um, and so the observable I said is kind of trivial. All it's going to do is it's going to measure the output qubit of whatever evolution you've done until now. Okay? And in, that's essentially the same measurement that the original verifier for this QMSA problem would have done, just a single qubit measurement at the end. OK, so this is supposed to be the intuition. And this will go back to the clock thing just a little bit as well. Um, so what's supposed to happen in an honest setting? Uh, the good prover prepares the good proof y by flipping, you know, uh, doing single qubit Hamiltonian evolutions from the setup given it in VQA, right? And you know, ta-da! This takes exactly the Hamming weight number of, um, you know, remember I said in the yes case was a low Hamming weight proof, and in the no case was a big Hamming weight proof. But the number of evolutions you have to do is exactly the Hamming weight because it's just bit flips. That's all, right? So it's a perfect fit. And then once you're done that, um, you have to simulate the verifier. OK, and that takes some number of gates, L, whatever L is. OK, and finally, you have this observable. OK, so the bad news is that um, what is the hardness ratio we get out of this? In the yes case, um, I apply um, G plus L gates, where G is small. In the no case, I apply G prime plus L gates, where uh, G prime is large. And what I really wanted to see here is G prime over G, not G prime plus L over G plus L. L is a big polynomial. That's bad. It kills my ratio, right? And this is exactly why we need that annoying 2D clock. It's really an artificiality because um, all it's doing is that, you know, over here when I'm flipping one bit of the proof, it normally costs me one. I'm going to make you go through some convoluted path in this 2D space uh, to make it cost a lot. 
you have to be, be a bit careful because the clock has to be succinctly represented. You can't like use a ton of space up because then it blows up the encoding size of the instance. But the basic premise is just this. I'm making like busy beaver or something, right? Like, good. And then when you do that, the ratio becomes this, right? I blow up the cost of each bit flip to be this times D. D is bigger than L, so the L essentially disappears. Yep. That's essentially it. Um, I'm essentially out of time, I think, so um, let me just say that soundless is proven basically um, in the sense that I can show, not us, but I mean, as a group, we can show that regardless of what, how you choose to do these evolutions, whatever angles you use, what order, ultimately you're stuck in some logical computation subspace which you cannot escape out of. So it's kind of like the illusion of choice, right? I say you can do the evolutions in any order you want, right? But ultimately you're going to do what Big Brother says, right? Um, just like any good government, right? Uh, okay, so that's it. And so this is how soundness is shown. And I won't say anything about maybe QAOA in the interest of time. Um, the very basic premise is just that if I have just two evolution uh, Hamiltonians and I need to cram all that logic in, um, the starting point is that um, all the odds time steps, we try and put them in you know, one Hamiltonian, all the even time steps in the other one. And we do it in such a way that everything commutes and you could work it out. It gets more complicated, but it can be done. This part is the closest to um, Lennart and Martin's original work. Good, so maybe let me just summarize. Okay, we said that um, estimating the optimal depth as VQA is intractable. Okay, um, this gives us hardness of approximation for QCMA. And there are many open questions, right? Um, for example, noisy setting is a big one, right? Um, hardness of approximation for other QCMA complete problems. This is something um, my student Katzen and I are working on, for example. And this one I really like because it's not obvious at all. Um, we showed hardness for QAOA, optimizing depth, but it doesn't apply to the farhi goldstone gutman setting. Because in that setting, uh, they had a diagonal cost Hamiltonian. And we have no idea how to make our construction work for diagonal Hamiltonians. We're embedding Kitaev's construction, and that's just not diagonal. You know? so, so this is, I, I wonder if you can get at least MP hardness of approximation out for that farhi goldstone gutman max cut QAOA. That would be very interesting. Good. That's it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Stefan. So, are there any questions? Um, I'm a bit confused about this. Um, of course, you didn't say anything about how to keep the subspace. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Uh, but just maybe uh, for some intuition. I can sketch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the quark, of course, I mean, because it's a uh, Quantum quark, it's probably cyclic, right? It will like, you know, it will cycle around. Mm -hmm. And how does that not screw up the, the computational well, subspace? So, so, okay, so here's the thing. You can you can do whatever you want. You can go forwards, backwards in time, right? But all of the Hamiltonians basically they're labeled with a clock transition, you know, tag basically that says that you know this Hamiltonian will only have a non-trivial effect if the current time reads say t. And when you apply it, it will at least partially rotate you into the next time step. Right? This is this is all it can do. And you can run it backwards if you want. You can do whatever you want. You cannot. Yeah. Yeah. You cannot go directly to zero. You need to go back. There, we have no transition to do that. Okay. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. That's, 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 okay. Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. But that's also where this structure lemma comes from. Like the, the Hamiltonians will only work it in the right time steps in some sense. Yeah. Julia. Yeah. If uh, if the string has time away that is high, then yeah. you you can pull the verification algorithm. Yes. So there's a there's a default size that if it's big enough the Hemingway it'll always accept. Yeah. Yeah. This is where this monotone set comes in, which I didn't define. There has to be some string of some Hemingway that's accepted. Yes. Okay. Maybe oh. the other side can play with it a little bit. Just a bit. Uh, is that again? 